Okay, so uh, here's our project so far. It uh, is looking like a mobile interface. Uh, you can uh, go from to the different screens. Obviously, only the home screen has the nav bar. If you go to about, it, it doesn't have it. And if you go to contact, it doesn't have it. We can copy and paste it so that it's on all of the screens. Before we do that, let's fix a little bit more right here because we have the href, we have data icon. This is also a good place to put in the transition, the animation. It went back to the basic fade animation. So here, we'll add a data transition. Here's one that I like, flip. The screen rotates in an, in an, in an interesting way. And you could have a different transition on each one of these, but that would be very amateur. You want to have the same transition on each of these, because then you're going to confuse your users. You have the point of the animation of the transition to get attention to the user. So if you've got different kinds of animations on each of the buttons, you're going to confuse people. Well, what happened? That didn't look normal. If you have a slide animation, that might be a, for a certain purpose, like it slides up to register for the app. You have the flip animation to go between screens. You have the pop animation for a message. That makes sense to use different transitions. But if you were to put pop, flip, and fade on each of the different buttons, that is confusing. Why is it doing different things for the same conceptual thing? I'm just going from screen to screen. So it's a mark of an amateur. Also, when we talk about fonts, we will be able to use any font we want. A mark of an amateur is to use any font we want. What we want to do is use the fonts judiciously. We want to use maybe two fonts, maybe three fonts. Amateur is we're going to use 12 fonts because they all they look cool and I like them all. No, you want two fonts, maybe three, one font. You want restraint. Same thing here. If I run this, the flip animation is this. The screen kind of flips over in, in an interesting way. It's more obvious when you go from home to about with actual content. Contact doesn't have very much, so it doesn't flip too much. But about flips, and so does home. We have flip, we have fade, we have others we can look up. Here's one more. We'll, we'll look at the documentation in detail for all of them later. But here's another one that I think is interesting. I think it's too extravagant. It's called Flow. Test that one out yourself and see how Flow looks. So these work best when there is more content on the screen, but Flow is like you flick the screen off to the side. An animation like this, though, is also more processor-heavy or resource-intensive. So if you're running your app on an older device, let's say I'm running it on an iPhone 5, you know, the animation might be, might be slow. If I'm running it on an Android 2.3, again, it might look jerky. So some of these... that's why Fade is the basic one, because it looks fine on every device. But uh, again, I like Flip. That one usually works pretty well on most devices. Flow looks like this. So I'm going to keep it on flip. What I want to do is, this is a fully set up navigation bar, which I am missing on the other pages. So if you were to copy and paste, <coughs> if it works, of course. It's very easy to copy and paste code that doesn't quite work. So if it works, this nav bar, this whole chunk here, you can copy it and paste it into your About screen. There's, there's going to be better ways to do more, to do persistent nav bars. Right now, with our knowledge of what I want to do so far, each page is sort of an independent entity, and therefore it needs its own footer, its own navbar, etc. Later we can make a persistent navbar that exists on all pages. It needs a little more setup, however. 
for the moment, I'll copy the navbar and then I'll paste it into about page in the same place in the header after the H1. Here's an example about me selecting and it pasted it a little weird. We indented it too much, so just delete those tabs. But it doesn't matter. Remember, HTML doesn't matter about the doesn't care about the empty space. The web browser ignores it. White space. So now uh, on the about page, I've got links that let me go from screen to screen. And uh, they all inherit that animation because I copied and pasted it. The page two that we the the contact page the page two that we left along alone a while ago it's very very bare. You can fully set it up to make it work more complete. I'm leaving it as, as is, but it's fine as it is. You may have noticed, I haven't changed it yet, but you may have noticed, I'm on home screen and if I click contact or go to screen two, it doesn't work anymore. It used to work, but not anymore. Why? We changed page two is, is no longer page two. Now it's a contact page. So the original link the original link was pointing to page two, which doesn't exist anymore. Contact exists. So that button that used to work doesn't work anymore. It's pointing to the wrong ID. Can easily fix it by just changing that to contact. This button actually is completely super superfluous. I'm going to deactivate it. You can delete it, but we'll deactivate it. I put a comment to comment out that line. I've got it on line 26, but it's in your in your home screen in the article. In the home section. <coughs> So I added the comments to remove that button. It served its purpose just to show you a link can be upgraded to a button. We've got better buttons. We've got the nav bar at the top. I just want to use now article, article inside the home section just to write something like welcome. Heading one for the header. Heading four for the footer, heading two and three for the article. That only works when we're dealing with JavaScript. And right now, since we're in the body, the main uh, HTML area, the slashes don't work. <coughs> this is the project then. Simple welcome. About. Contact is still pretty bare. Navigation to go from screen to screen. 
headers and footers. We'll touch on this now, and then we'll get deeper into it later. Design-wise, everyone's screen looks the same, gray on gray. Later we will um, customize with colors and fonts and all that great stuff, and alignment and all of that stuff. It can be fully customized. One thing to touch upon, though, is the way that works is by using the jQuery mobile theme system. Right now, by default, Every element here is using theme A, the default A theme of gray. We can do this. If we go to the section of about, we have data role page and ID. I prefer to leave ID as the last element or the last attribute always. It's not right or wrong, it's just that I prefer and I teach to leave the ID or the class as the last attribute. Let's back up then, before that, and add an attribute of data-theme. I like to leave ID or class at the end because I can quickly find it in a block of code. We have the default of A. Let's activate theme B. To the section of about, I'm changing the theme, I'm changing the color, the design. Save it and run it, and move from the home screen to the about screen and see the difference. So if we were to look at that, about suddenly looks really cool. Obviously this is only applying to the about screen because that's the only one that has data theme B. So yes, you would need to add data theme B to the other screens for them to become the dark theme, theme B. Now uh, with jQuery 1.4.5, which is what we're using, by default we only have A and B. With version 1.3, we had versions A, B, C, D, E, F. And they were just different colors, a yellow theme, a green theme, just different colors. But they took that out in version 1.4.5 because it, what's the point? That green is not the green of your company. That yellow is not the yellow of your company. So later on, when we talk about the theme building um, software, we will be able to build our own color of any, any choice you know, red on the header, and a little yellow in the footer, and this color, that color on the buttons, whatever. And we can set it as, D, as theme C, all the way up to T, theme Z, or Z. We have 26 possible color combinations that we could devise, themes A through Z, uh, once we talk about the theme building software. We'll see that later. But for the moment, I'll leave it just as B. We have A and B, a couple of different color choices. Later, we'll make our own better color scheme. So we're going to spend some time in the coming weeks. Here was just sort of an introduction to the concept of jQuery Mobile. We're going to spend the weeks, first of all, we're going to take a little time to kind of brainstorm uh, and wireframe an app. We're going to, before we jump into the code, we're going to plan an app a little bit. Because it's always better to start with a plan instead of just jumping into the code. So next time, on next Tuesday, we'll plan a little. We'll get back into the code after we've got an idea because we will have goals. I want an app that does this and this and this. And I want an app to look like this and like that. Once we have a basic idea, then we'll start to write code for the interface aspect. Then we'll write more code for the interactivity aspect. So month one, we spend most of the time dealing with the HTML, right? It's in the title of the class. We deal with the design, the HTML, and the CSS. And then starting on part two, which will come sooner than you think, then we're going to start looking at, okay, how do we take this 
and then package it to the apps. What's the software that we need? And then we'll start to add more advanced code, part three, even more advanced code. By then we'll be talking about databases in part three to store data and other cool features of the device. And part three also includes publishing the device, uh, publishing the project, compiling it for the devices. So we have a lot of things to cover. Uh, for the moment, uh, let's do this. Go ahead and go to the web browser and open a window and let's go to Wikipedia. Let's go to the website wikipedia.org and then search for the article down there, jQuery Mobile. Question in the back there, ladies? Thank you. 
So here in Wikipedia, I just want you to take a quick look at the jQuery article. So go ahead and search right here jQuery mobile. And here is an article uh, on jQuery mobile. And um, it goes on to tell you what the theory of it is. What is this? It's a touch-optimized web framework, uh, specifically a JavaScript library currently in development. And the purpose of it is to help you make apps that work on a variety of devices. It focuses on an interface. Uh, this uh, framework is compatible with other mobile app frameworks, such as PhoneGap and so forth. Make a note that PhoneGap is synonymous with Cordova, which is what I've mentioned already. We're going to use something called Cordova to compile our project for all the devices, to convert it to all the devices. Right now, it's still a website. It's not an app. It looks starting to look like an app, but it's still our project, just a website. Using PhoneGap, also known as Cordova, we will then compile it to the right devices. So this project's been around a while, since 2010. The license is very... it's a very liberal uh, license in that you can use it for your projects. You don't have to pay them, you don't have to really credit them. It's very open for you to use this uh, code in your project. Other libraries or frameworks require you to pay. This one is very open. Features, you can read that. It works on all devices. The HTML5 powered. Quick example, this is focusing a little bit more on the JavaScript aspect of things. Uh, for example, you tap on an element, you get an alert pop-up that says you tapped this element. You have other things that happen as well. Uh, you click on an element on click, it's going to slide down at 500 milliseconds. We'll learn this, we'll understand what this means a little later, of course. Basic example, if you scroll down, this is what we did together today. This is the example that we started to look at. Ours is a little better because we've got a nav bar and this one doesn't. But this is the introduction that I like to use for jQuery Mobile, something tangible. This code on its own doesn't look that impressive, but then when we when we do it and we run our code, you know, we, we get this. And this is all from jQuery Mobile and HTML. Goes on to talk about themes, we touched on theme B and so forth. Compatibility, basically it works on all the devices. Uh, release history, etc. Okay, good information. But what I want to get out of it is, let's go uh, directly to the original documentation. Let's go to jQueryMobile.com. The official website, jQueryMobile.com. <coughs> A touch-optimized web framework, jQuery Mobile, is an HTML5-based user interface system designed to make responsive websites and apps that are accessible on all smartphone, tablet, and desktop devices. Let's go look at the doc let's look, go look at demos of what you can do with this. At the top click demos. We're using the latest version, 145. Here's the older ones. You don't really have to bother with that. Just go to 
1.4.5. Here's a, another spot where you can further your knowledge. Uh, how do I do this? How do I do that? It's all here. Um, if you scroll down, find the section about icons. CSS framework icons. Here's a list of all possible built-in icons and example code and so forth. Explanation, how to make your own icons. Here we go. Data-icon equals action gives you that icon. Data-icon equals arrow-d-l down left gives you a down left icon. So there's 50 of these built in. I'm making it a calendar in my app. There's a calendar icon. You want your own with your own design, you have a way to create it. It'll tell you in the documentation later on. For most people, these are going to work pretty well. Um, you know, there's like to log in. Maybe I use this lock icon to represent the login system. We will do a login system in our app. Uh, we'll be able to log in, have multiple user accounts, and all of that. So log in, log out. Uh, camera, video. We did camera. There's one of video. Okay, custom icons. Well, before that, oftentimes the documentation will give you examples and explanation text, and then it'll show view source. So by looking at view source, you may then see uh, via HTML uh, a way to do this. So example code. So right there, icon dash action. The custom icon. There's no skull icon. It looks cool, but there's no skull icon built in. The way you make that, if you view source, this one has it two ways. You need to do something in the HTML, and then you need to do something in the CSS. In the CSS, something is defined, my icon. It could be called ui-icon-skull. You write the code that says the image is here size, and so forth. And then on the HTML, you have ui-icon-mycolor. Some of the documentation, it says data-whatever, and some of it says ui-whatever. They're both synonymous. You just have to read the example of how they're using it. These are going by class. This is very similar if, as if it were data-icon-button, or data role equals button. It's just another way to write it. There's a couple of ways to write the code. I'll point out why we might do one as opposed to the other. The documentation tells you everything of how it works. We had only put our icon uh, by default in the navbar at the top. There are ways to move it to the left, right, bottom, etc. There's a way also to only have an icon, not text. I want a button that is simply an icon. So we can see the example, how that's set up. We're using no text, the no text attribute. Any of these examples here, you can double click to select the code. Shadows, colors. Let's say I don't want the circle around the icon. It tells you how to do that. Uh, use no disk. black icons, white icons, we could do red and yellow icons, whatever, later. So all the documentation for each element is at the document, is here at the site. Um, <coughs> if you go back, transitions. We talked a little bit about the animations going from screen to screen, right? So if you go to transitions, They give you the example and the code. There's flow, the ones we didn't look at. Turn, uh, slide, fade. So there's not a lot of transitions here. It does tell you how to make your own later, but making a transition is a lot harder than making an icon. And it previews it. For example, pop. Later we'll learn, well, I want to make a pop-up or a dialogue, etc. See the animation. Exactly. The transitions are going to be a lot harder for us to design, but it's available. 
setting transitions, browser support, etc. When we create our app again, uh, the, the, the big purpose of the class is I'm going to give you a lot of puzzle pieces and show you how the puzzle pieces work. It's still up to you to decide how to put those pieces together to accomplish what you want to do in an app. We together will have a goal that we'll all go toward, and then you'll be working on your own version too. So for example, I need a way to display data in a nice, readable way. We have things such as a list view. I need to display you know, a list of all of this data. Uh, I, I would read the documentation and implement it. So we'll do this next time. But if you look at list view, examples are like this. You can create nice looking divisions of content that stretches across the screen with an order. You can have them as active links. Again, you view source. This one is an unordered list of bullet points with a data role of list view. Previously, we used unordered list, data role, nav bar and it made a nav bar. The same concept of bullet points here then gets upgraded to a list view with the right data attribute. You can combine a lot of really interesting things. Here's one set to inset. Instead of, instead of it going from end to end of the screen, it has a roundness <coughs> to it and a little border that is said in data inset true in addition to data role of list view. This is really cool here. A filter. Let's say I have a variety of elements and then as I start to type C, it's only going to show the C elements and then CR, only the R. That was a very hard thing to do in the old days. A lot of JavaScript processing. List view, I mean uh, view source, will then tell you how to do it. Data filter true. Basically, it's going to create a way for you to filter your list of elements. To populate those elements, that's still going to require JavaScript and other behavior code. But we have the element to display a bunch of stuff, and then people can search through it. Data filter placeholder, that's what appears in the box. Data inset true, so that it doesn't go all the way to the edge. Here's the opposite. Filter reveal. Nothing is visible until people start to type. You just get a search box, you start to type C, and all the C uh, fruit appears. That one's, a, that one's a little backwards. A little more setup, perhaps, also. We have all of these pieces of a puzzle that we're going to use to make our project. So I wanted to uh, show you this um, jQuery site, the Wikipedia article. I brought up the Wikipedia article also because I would follow some of these links, like PhoneGap, which we're going to look at later. You can also look at the bottom, see also. Other examples here, jQuery, all of that. So just to show off here, this Wikipedia article, Wikipedia obviously is a global website. It's one of the most trafficked websites in the world. People visit this jQuery mobile article to keep up to date with jQuery. And this example that we used here, we used it ourselves in, in the class right now. But if you're curious, if you go to the top of the, J, of the jQuery mobile article, every article on Wikipedia has a history um, of edits. If you look there, you can see that I am Wikipedia famous because I edited the article to make that example. So everyone that's looking at that example that wants to know about jQuery mobile, that was, that's all me. I put that example there. No one's messed with it yet, that's good. And uh, people can uh, learn jQuery the way I put it there. 
So, um, these are the pieces that we're going to use for month one, jQuery mobile. Uh, we're going to wrap up at 9 and we'll do lab time until 9.30. Uh, remember, log into Blackboard. You'll have access to Blackboard. You'll have to do a few tasks on Blackboard once or twice or so per week as part of the requirements. If you're having any trouble with that, see me. Any general questions on things we talked about today? How does jQuery survive? Uh, good question. Donations. Just solely on donations? Um, never really thought about it, but maybe because it's just such a commonly used project that I don't doubt. See right here, support the project. So I don't doubt like big companies also support. So they're not really selling that. Maybe they sell other things under the jQuery Foundation. Is that MIT? Don't. Well, the thing about MIT is that's the that's the particular name of a license. How are we how are we licensing out our code? The MIT license is one of these ones that is very open that says anyone can use our code. That does that puts out a license like that? No, I mean is it all free? There's many uh, many open source projects, way too many maybe, out here. Because all of these on top here, there's jQuery, there's jQuery Mobile, there's jQuery UI, and a bunch of other ones. So there's it's a whole open source ecosystem nowadays. So this is the most widely used? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's it for the moment. Uh, I'll put my code in the folder. I'll turn on the printer. I'll upload the videos. We'll have some lab time until 9.30 if you need it. And see you online and see you on Tuesday.